These are some supplementary notes for Physics 2140, uh, where we talk about the effects of magnetism. I put this together in 2015. I'll probably use it in subsequent classes in later years. Uh, there may be some slight notational differences as I change things a little bit from year to year, but hopefully everything will make sense to you. We would discuss two topics which don't quite follow onto each other. The first is what happens when a charge moves in a uniform magnetic field at an angle, not perpendicular to the field. The second is what happens when you place a current loop in a magnetic field and how it spins. We talk about, we'll talk about this a little bit in class, uh, but I'm going to skip over the details. The details are here. In class, we discussed that if you place a charge in a uniform magnetic field, it feels a force equal to V cross B. And if you have a situation where the magnetic field is perpendicular to the velocity of a charge, it's going to feel a force, it's going to move in a circle like that. But what if V is not perpendicular to B? That is, what if V has a component which is perpendicular to B, but also a component which lies along B? Let's consider that next. So let's suppose I've got a magnetic field which points straight up, and I've got a particle, a charged particle, we'll say it's positive, which kind of points at an angle, like this. We can break this velocity down into two components. A component which is perpendicular to the field, which I'll call V perp, and a component which is parallel to the field, which I'll call V parallel. And we can write the force on this particle is QV cross B, or I can break the V down into the parallel piece and the perpendicular piece. And I can distribute the cross product over the sum. So I've got Q V parallel cross B plus Q V perp cross B. Now this first term is equal to zero because V parallel points in the same direction as B. And if you take two vectors which point in the same direction, you take the cross product, you get, um, you get zero. So that means that the motion along the field stays the same. That is, if this positive charge has some upward velocity, it's going to continue to have that same upward velocity. Uh, this term, however, q v per cross b, that's just going to give us circular motion perpendicular to b. That is, this charge is going to be moving upward, but it's also going to be circling around in and out of the page. I'm drawing pictures in the air and you can't see. So let's try this again. So if I've got b, which points upward like this, then I'm going to have this pos positive charge. It's going to, this is really hard to draw. It's going to have an upward motion, but also a circular motion like this. All right. Basically, it's going to move in a helical, a helical path. Okay. So generally speaking, charges which move in a uniform magnetic field move in a helical path. Now, the width of this helix depends on how strong the field is. If the field is strong, the helix will be a tight helix. That is, the radius will be very, very small. And so it might look something like this. And from a distance, this is assuming that the magnetic field points to the right. And so from a distance, it looks like the charge is moving 
along the field line. This seems to be contrary to what we, uh, how we initially described the magnetic field. It sounds more like what the electric field does. The electric field causes a charge to move in the direction of the field. We said that the magnetic field exerts a force in every other direction except the direction of the magnetic field. But in this case, what the magnetic field is doing is it's basically canceling out any motion which is not along the B field. Let me draw another picture. Uh, so if I have a magnetic field line, let's say, I've got a magnetic field which points upward. If I have a positive charge come in at a, with an upward slant, it's going to hit this magnetic field and it's going to spin around like that. I'm not doing a helix very well. Let's try that again. Okay, I can't do a helix. Ah, that's, that's not too bad. Anyway. It's going to, maybe I'll just, anyway, it's going to <laughs> move upward along the field line. Now, if I take a positive charge and I bring it in like this, it's actually going to move in this direction. Okay, so that's one difference between an electric field and a magnetic field, is that the direction that the charge moves along the field line depends on its initial velocity, not on its um that on the charge. It's not like positive charges always move along uh, in the direction of the magnetic field. It can move in either direction. But if the field is strong, it's the magnetic field line kind of traps the charge, keeps it moving in one direction. This has um, great consequences in astronomy. Uh, for example, this is a picture of a solar prominence. on the sun. Okay? Um, and for, for reference, this the Earth might be that little blue dot there, just for size. Now what you're seeing is you're seeing a picture of the magnetic of the magnetic field lines on the sun. Now the magnetic field does weird things on the sun. But what we're seeing is we're seeing a magnetic field line which kind of looks like that. And I might say, well, how can I see a magnetic field line? I don't have magnetic vision. Is this some special camera? No. What's going on is that in the atmosphere of the sun, there is plasma. That is, it's hot, glowing, charged particles. All right, so I've got all these par charged particles, and they're so hot that they're glowing brightly. And so I've got all these little positive charges. They're coming in, and they are spiraling around this field line. And because they're hot, and I've got all these charged particles following this field line, we see that um, we can see this bright line, all of these bright charges moving along the field line, tracing out the field lines for us to see. Um, so the fact that we can see these solar prominences. Now when the solar prominence, uh, I should point out just for astronomy buffs that this is this point here where the field line goes back into the sun, that's a sunspot. Those are sunspots there and there. Um, and when one, sometimes one of these prominence lines kind of breaks free of the sun and escapes out into space, that's a solar flare. And that kind of releases all these charged particles to fly out towards the rest of the solar system. Now that's a problem for us, or it could be, because all those charged particles have a lot of energy. They would, if the Earth were unprotected, they would all come and run into us and cause great problems. Fortunately, the Earth has a magnetic field as well. So here it is. There's magnetic field. Uh, I actually drew it upside down, didn't I? If I were a good podcaster, I would redo this audio, but I'm probably not going to. Anyway, so the Earth has this magnetic field, and when the, the charged particles all come in from the sun, positive and negative, this is the solar wind, these charged particles come here, they hit our magnetic field, and instead of reaching the Earth, they all get trapped 
by are the magnetic field of the Earth. Okay, and they bounce back and forth from pole to pole, boing, 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 um, until they lose energy. And once they lose energy, they're no longer as dangerous as they were before. Um, when these charged particles, you see they come pretty close to the surface of the Earth near the poles. And when these charged particles interact with the atmosphere, we get aurora probably heard of these, the Aurora Borealis, those are the ones in the north, or the Aurora Australis, those are the ones in the south. And that's basically Let's start with the formula for the force on a current. Current, of course, is moving charge, and so if you have a current in In a magnetic field, it's going to feel a force uh, equal to I L cross B. I L is a vector which points in the direction of the current, and and its magnitude is equal to the length, as we talked about in class. Now, I'd like to ask, what would the force on a square loop of wire look like? So here's my square loop. This is a loop of wire, and I'm going to say that the current is going clockwise. So there must be a little battery in this in here somewhere. I don't really care why. And suppose I put this loop in a magnetic field which points downward. We'll say that this loop has height h and length l. Oh, uh, let's call this W. In length and in, in width W. Now, let's say, what are the forces on these wires? Well, if I look at the top wire, I get I cross B. I cross B in this case is right cross down. That is into the page. If I look on the right wire, I've got down cross down, that's no force at all. Uh, on the left, no force at all. And on the bottom, I've got the force pointing inward or outward. Okay, we see that the net force, the net force on the loop is equal to zero, but there will be a net torque. That is, the loop is going to spin. What is that net torque? Well, if you remember, and this is going back to mechanics a little bit, the torque is equal to R cross F, where R is the lever arm. Okay, so if I have like a door on a hinge and I apply a force right here, then R is the vector from the hinge to the point where the force is being applied. And if I take the R cross F there, R cross F is going to point into the page. What do I mean when I say that the torque points into the page? That means you can use a right hand rule. If the torque points into the page, that means that the thing is going to spin clockwise. That is your thumb, let your thumb point in the direction of the torque and your fingers shows you the direction that the thing is going to spin. Obviously that door is going to turn clockwise when I apply a force to it. All right. Um, so in the case of my loop, I've got two different forces and I'd like to calculate the torque. So the torque on the top wire is equal to R cross F. Let's say I just want the magnitude. Um, R, in this case, is the distance from the top wire to the pivot. In this case, the pivot is going to be this middle line here, because obviously the loop is going to spin around the halfway line. And the length of the lever arm, then, is h over 2. Okay. The force is equal to I times the length of the wire, which I'm going to call W, times the magnetic field, B. 
Okay, and it, it's really IL cross B. Well, we can see that the current and the magnetic field are perpendicular, so the cross product just becomes the value itself. All right, um, so the top torque is H over 2 times IWB. The bottom, the torque on the bottom wire is also H over 2 IWB. And we see that both torques are tending to cause rotation in the same direction. If I want to be very careful about it, if I take uh, R for the top wire, R points uh, upward. So R cross F, that torque points to the left, which means it's going to spin um, around it. If I point my th thumb in the left direction, it's going to spin in towards the page, which I already knew because I know the direction of the force. The bottom torque is also going to point inward. And so the net torque is equal to H I W B. Hmm. Uh, I can rearrange this a little bit. I can write this as I times H W B. And what is H W? H W is the area of the loop. Okay. And so the torque on this loop is equal to IAB. That is the current in the loop times the area of the loop times the magnetic field. Now let's, all right, so it's going to start spinning then. And imagine if you will, the top one is spinning into the page, the bottom wire is spinning out of the page. It spins a little later, a little while, until eventually the loop is lying flat on, you know, kind of, so you're looking at it edge on, and the magnetic field is pointing down through it. Uh, and it looks a little bit like this. This is hard to picture because um, I can't draw them 3D. But now imagine I'm looking at the loop and the current is running clockwise. This is a little bit later, but the magnetic field is now pointing down into the page. What are the forces? Well, the force on the top wire, I've got right cross B, that's going to be equal, right cross, uh, right cross into the page, it points up. All right, this, the right side wire, it's gonna feel a force to the right. The bottom wire is gonna feel a force down, and the left wire is gonna feel a force to the left. Okay, we see that these forces are not going to, first of all, the forces are going to cancel due to symmetry, and they're also going not going to cause a torque. If anything, they would try to stretch the wire out, and we'll assume that the wire is strong enough to resist that. Okay, so the net force is equal to zero, the net torque is equal to zero, and the loop is in equilibrium here. All right, so if the magnetic field points through a loop, it's in equilibrium and it doesn't spin. But if the magnetic field points along the loop, as in the previous page, that one there, um, then it will spin. That's interesting. Let's define a new vector, which I'm going to call the area vector, a vec. Okay, the magnitude of this vector is simply the area of the loop. The direction of the area vector, I'm going to say that the area vector is perpendicular to the loop. All right, this is assuming that the loop can lie flat on a table. And so if it's lying flat on the table, the area vector could point either up or down. Which direction does it point? Um, well, I'm going to use a right hand rule to define the direction. I'm going to, um, I'll call this right hand rule number two. It's going to be related to right-hand rule number two that we mentioned in class. And it's a circle line variety. That is, I'm going to curl my fingers of my right hand, of course, in the direction of the current. And then my thumb will point in the direction of AVEC. Okay, so for example, if I have a current which is clockwise sitting on the page, I curl my right hand fingers clockwise, my thumb points into the page. And, but if I have a current which is running counterclockwise, 
the area vector points out of the page. And really, you could just copy down these two these two circuits here, and that's all you really need to remember about it. You don't even have to use your right hand at all. Just remember it clockwise into the page, counterclockwise out of the page. Okay. So now let's look at those two loops again. So I've got this clockwise current, etc. That means that the area vector, as I said, points into the page. Now, if the magnetic field points uh, down, that was the first slide, then the torque is equal to IAB. And it's actually IAB to the left. I would make that a vector, so I better put a vector head on the tau. If the magnetic field points into the page, then the torque is equal to zero. Now notice that the torque definition has A and B, two vectors. Okay. We also see that if the two vectors are perpendicular to each other, then we have A. Their magnitudes are multiplied together, but if they're parallel to each other, the torque is zero. That makes me think of a cross product. And in fact, I can generalize these two results in this formula. I can write tau, the torque on this loop, is equal to I A cross B. Okay. What does that tell me? That tells me if A and B point in the same or opposite directions, no torque is felt on the loop. But if A and B are perpendicular to each other or point in any other direction, then the loop is going to feel a spin. Now, I'm going to make one more generalization, and this is coming back to things that I'll, I'll talk about in class. This thing here, I and A, I times A vec, those are both properties of the loop itself. If I've got this current going on and it's got a certain size, that doesn't depend on external stuff. So I'm going to give that a name. I'm going to say that that is mu vec, and I'm going to call that the magnetic dipole moment. of the loop. Okay. Now mu vec is a vector, but it points in the same direction as a vec. That is, we use the same right-hand rule number two that we mentioned before. Curl your fingers in the direction of the current. Your thumb points in the direction of the magnetic dipole moment. Okay. And that means that tau is equal to mu cross b. I'm going to box that because that's the form, form of the equation which I'm going to show in class. Now, what does that mean in practice? Well, one thing it means is that instead of drawing these loops all the time, I can simply represent this loop with a vector, with its area vector, or its dipole moment mu. That makes it easier to draw, for one thing. Um, the second thing it means is that, now suppose I have a magnetic field which points this way, and I take a loop whose, air, whose magnetic dipole moment points that way. All right. If I want to say, all right, what's going to happen to that loop? Well, mu and b are not parallel, not anti-parallel, not pointing opposite directions. Therefore, they're going to feel a torque. They're going to feel a torque equal to mu cross b. Now, mu and b both lie in the plane, so that means that mu cross b is perpendicular to the plane, which means it either points out of the page or into the page. And if I use a right-hand rule, for the cross product. My fingers point along mu, my palm points in the direction of b, my thumb tells me mu cross b, I see that this is going to point out of the page. What does an out of the page torque mean? If the torque is out of the page, that means my fingers curl to tell me that the, that the, uh, that the dipole moment is going to spin in that direction. Okay. So if mu points kind of up and to the right and the magnetic field points straight up, then this loop is going to spin in this direction. Once it reaches, once it's pointing upward, it's not going to spin anymore. Okay, so this is an equilibrium point, and this is the dipole moment trying to reach equilibrium. If I try something else, let's say I have this, um, well, I'll use the same color here. If I have the magnetic field pointing up, but the dipole moment kind of pointing 
down and to the right. And I say, what is the torque on this dipole? Again, if I point my fingers in the direction of mu and the B shoots out of my palm, the torque is also going to point out of the page. Okay, so that means that this dipole moment is also going to try to spin so that it points upward. All right, how about over here? Let's suppose the magnetic field points up, but the dipole moment points like that way. Well, now if I use the right hand rule, I see that the torque points into the page, which is a clockwise spin, so that the dipole moment is going to turn clockwise. In all three pictures, we see, and if we can try any other example, we see that consistently, no matter what direction the dipole moment points, the loop is going to turn, it's going to feel a torque. It wants to turn so that the dipole moment points in the direction of the magnetic field. Now that's interesting. What else do you know that there's something else which likes to align itself with the magnetic field? And that's a compass needle. In fact, that's how we define the, the direction of the magnetic field. We say it's the direction a compass would point, or more generally, a magnetic dipole, okay? Which is why we're calling this the magnetic dipole moment. In fact, um, all right, so mu likes to align with the magnetic field. Dipoles also like to align with the magnetic field, okay? And in fact, what we can do then is we can take a normal old bar magnet okay, and we can draw a vector from the south pole of the bar magnet to the north pole of the bar magnet, okay? And call that the magnetic dipole moment of the bar magnet. Now, there's no formula for this. It's just something you have to test. It's, it's a property of the magnet. In fact, the magnetic dipole moment tells you the strength of the bar magnet. Um, so a, a typical bar magnet might have a dipole moment of half an ampere square meter, for example. Okay? And if you define the dipole moment of a bar magnet in that way, that means that if you've got the magnetic field pointing up and you've got a bar magnet like this, north, south, and you want to know what is the torque on that bar magnet. Not just, oh, it's going to spin to a line to the uh, to the point upward, but how, uh, what's making it spin? What is the torque on it? The torque on this bar magnet is also equal to its dipole moment, whatever that is, crossed with the magnetic field, okay? So uh, we started this whole chapter by talking about the force of a magnetic field on a moving charge, which seems a strange place to start by uh, talking about the effects of the magnetic field, because when we think of magnetic fields, we think of how they affect dipoles. But uh, now we see that by starting with the moving charge, we can get a formula for the torque on a dipole.